So hello everybody and today we will talk about uh, some uh, tough uh, items about what's going on over our heads uh, in the sky each morning in Ukraine about bombing, about tactics of Russian forces and why they're doing it and we'll do it with our guests. Uh, I uh, welcome Professor Omar Ashor is a professor of security and military studies and uh, the uh, founding chair of the critical security studies uh, department at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies, right? This yes, is correct. 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 Um, I am really welcome you because uh, it's maybe fourth time when we try to connect uh, and so we cannot do it because uh, each time we uh, set the time for our interview, we have to go to the shelter. This is our life nowadays. Yes, I uh, first I want to salute you for the uh, preservation. And uh, I want really to uh, express my love and support to the whole of Ukraine, uh, from Lviv to Luhansk and from Tumi all the way to Yalta, all, all Ukraine undivided, uh, for the heroic performance that I've been doing. I, I've just seen like amazing, amazing uh, bravery, courage, uh, kindness, uh, resilience. Uh, like nowhere, uh, like nowhere else. Uh, basically, I, I, you, you told me we tried to do this four times in the shelter. I had one colleague, a professor, who was giving a lecture uh, about Ukraine, about what's happening, and the shelling was just behind him. Uh, we were hearing the bombs, and I asked him multiple times to stop it, you know, and 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 he refused. He he just continued his lecture just for the world to know what's happening in Ukraine. So, uh, Omar, my first question will be uh, uh, based on uh, the articles that I wrote from you. So, you're writing that in Ukraine, Russian forces have employed both methods of uh, warfare. It has employed tactics similar, similar to those used by the so-called Islamic State organization. What is this tactics and does it or doesn't work out? here as you see yeah uh, I think it's the the argument there was based on a, a, a history of Isis on a book that I wrote uh, which the title was how Isis fights and it's military tactics in four countries in Iraq Syria Libya and Egypt uh, but also elsewhere and also how Russia fought particularly in Crimea 2014 and uh, and then later on in uh, elsewhere so the to describe it very quickly, it's uh, it's basically an, a hybrid warfare attempt with urban terrorism. Um, so a series of infiltrations, um, a series of uh, agents, what we call them agents in charge, so uh, basically intelligence personnel who have assets, who have kinetic assets, uh, who have the, uh, the authority to bribe, to bomb, to assassinate, uh, and also to um, uh, make very, very quick decisions to control areas uh, inside a city. And uh, we saw this happening in Crimea, but also we saw it in terms of ISIS um, um, happening in Raqqa city and, and in Mosul and, and elsewhere. Uh, but the interesting part, ISIS did not have, an, you know, the 20,000 soldiers that uh, Russia had in Crimea and it did not have the capacity to do an air assault uh, or a an amphibious amphibious landing, um, because but Russia did so, which makes it more much more dangerous. Um, so we saw this, but also we saw very interesting uh, similarities as well, using IEDs in civilian areas in children parks, uh, using I, uh, IEDs as improvised explosive devices, basically bombs that uh, that do not discriminate between a soldier and a civilian. Uh, but using this in what we call retrogrades, in, in, in retreating back from uh, occupied uh, areas uh, like they, they did when they retreated from Kiev Oblast and from, from elsewhere and Chinese even elsewhere, leaving behind the trail of, of mines, uh, to, which was staggering, uh, even compared to what happened in Syria and Iraq uh, with, with the case of ISIS. Uh, so they, they're very good in covering their retreats with, with IEDs. Uh, also, we saw uh, we saw rapes, unfortunately, rapes and massive uh, violations, which ISIS also has done uh, in, in in multiple areas. Uh, and now we have the idea of the, the not just urban terrorism, but as as you're witnessing, unfortunately, now in Kiev, uh, terrorism from the air. You know, attacks targeting uh, civilians' infrastructure, uh, not just by bombing it. Um, 
and 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 uh, continuously uh, from from the ground, but also from the air by using, uh, as you know, the uh, Iranian-made drones, uh, Shahid 136. Um, so all these, uh, all, you know, the, the, you may uh, uh, see the differences in terms of uh, that's a non-state actor who is a, t a terrorist organization listed. Uh, everywhere, and this is like a, a mega uh, uh, power uh, internationally. But uh, one uh, one colleague has once called that uh, you know dragons sometimes can fight like snakes because it's cheaper to fight like a snake and it's more more effective to fight like a snake. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know you see the similarities there. The goals in Syria was to keep an authoritarian corrupt regime in power to stay there in power and to save it. Uh, you know. Uh, the goal in Ukraine, uh, among the goals in Ukraine, in, including annexed territory and so on, but uh, but just to repeat what happened in Crimea, but in Kyiv this time. So make, make sure that a democratically elected government chosen by the Ukrainian people gets toppled and then install a puppet regime a la, you know, uh, elsewhere. Um, uh, Czechoslovakia, 1968, uh, you know, Afghanistan in, uh, in 1978, 79, uh, and, and so on. The only aspect, the only so we have, we don't have an international definition agreed upon for terrorism. Mm -hmm. But the only part of the definition that everybody agrees on, I've been a, a counterterrorism consultant for over ten years. The only part of the definition that everybody agrees on is when you target civilian to put pressure on their government. You target civilian by violence, intentionally and indiscriminately to put pressure. On their government. Yeah, but uh, the main difference uh, in uh, these two cases that as much and the more they do it, the more angry people here become, and the more they are ready to serve to the country and uh, to fight uh, for our uh, independence, as you see. So it doesn't work like it worked in Syria. Do they understand this, or they just do it because nothing left? from the instrumental. So, yeah, no, uh, absolutely. So there is the rational dimension and the psychological dimension. The rational dimension is that it doesn't work. It, it just doesn't work. I don't, uh, it just makes people hate, you know, the, the, that intervention and the occupiers and mm. the, the, the ruling regime in Moscow even more. And, uh, and stiffen uh, the resilience, okay? Especially uh, when you have assets to contest it. If you don't have assets to contest it, you can be subdued. So it happened in Chechnya and it happened in, in, in partly in some parts of Syria because they didn't have air defenses to, to fight back. You know, but if you have your back with strong allies, with strong air defenses, yeah, you can, you can contest and, and repel an aggressor who's trying to uh, subdue you in this way by, by, via terrorism, basically. Identity is chosen, and if you want to choose a, a free, democratic, and 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 uh, a European modern European state, you will certainly not 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 look at the, the Putin example if you want to put it this way. The same interest for me is uh, about uh, Arabic world and uh, the countries that are far, far away from Ukraine. And that's why I want to ask you, uh, what do you see the role of the war in Ukraine on the development of the situation in the Arabic countries? Uh, how far this conflict uh, is uh, for their interests? Because from my reading, the headlines of the media in the countries of the East and Muslim world countries like Al Jazeera, I see that they have uh, some other interests uh, on the tops, uh, e except for Ukraine. So how the war in Ukraine affects the Arabic world, Muslim world, how do you see the picture from outside? Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, interest, uh, let's put it this way, because the war in Ukraine is really, it's about the international system, to, to, to be fair. Like the West sees it that way. But uh, also outside of the West uh, sees it that way. If uh, you want to maintain an international system as we know it today, you know, with no aggressions of a sovereign state uh, against the sovereign state and taking away its lands, uh, the big doesn't eat the strong. That that you know, if you want that that system to be maintained, then uh, you know you should take a stance. So that's on one end. So there's a political dimension there. But also there is an economic dimension is, uh, you know, the, the, the idea of gas and petroleum uh, is uh, Russia has weaponized it quite well. 
And I think Europe is looking for alternatives. And one of those alternatives is uh, basically the Middle East and North Africa, you know, whether uh, where I'm based in, in Qatar here, it's, uh, you know, the, the gas rich, it's a uh, gas rich country, but also in places like Algeria uh, and elsewhere um, in, in, in the region. Uh, so looking at alternatives to uh, provide uh, some energy uh, alternative and, and lessen the dependence, dependency on, on, uh, uh, on Russia. Um, so that, hence there is an interest. You mentioned Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera, uh, probably Al Jazeera English is less, but Al Jazeera Arabic, for example, it's almost uh, an intense coverage of Ukraine. They have correspondents almost in every oblast. And uh, they have a very good uh, coverage in that sense. And also uh, Al Arabi TV, which is another TV based here in, in Qatar, has a uh, uh, as well a very uh, uh, heavy coverage, and they, they have guests from Ukraine all the time. Th there are some uh, some ideas here about uh, uh, about you know the uh, the great times of the Soviet Union, uh, and there are some ideas, especially you know the left uh, the, the the Arab left. Let's put it this way. Uh, there's a bit of uh, antagonism towards the United States in particular. Yes. Uh, the uh, the Israeli-Palestinian uh, or the Arab-Israeli conflict gets uh, gets as well in the, in the whole uh, uh, perceptions. So, but 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 it, it's very clear as well, uh, you know, how um, how this war is uh, is affecting uh, the region. You would see some countries who who very clearly took the side of Mr. Putin. You know, they're they're very clear about that heart and mind. Uh, but there are other countries um, who were very uh, sympathetic with Ukraine, uh, opened the doors, uh, supported, sent messages usually to the Ukrainian um, uh, leadership. You know, the, here in the Doha Forum, for example, uh, the, the Ukraine was in every, in almost every uh, session uh, that happened in the last Doha Forum, the, one of the biggest international official gatherings uh, that happens here. You know, there, there is an idea, and of course, the whole region was watching what's happening in Syria, the, the amount of uh, bombardment, destruction uh, by Russia. Russia there. So it brings many things uh, home. I think the Syrians specifically um, uh, are, are quite aware of what could be done uh, to civilians uh, if that war um, uh, unfolded, uh, or if, that, if, if they have an experience of how the, the war can unfold and end up, you know, killing more and more uh, innocent people. It's interesting what makes sympathize uh, some of the co Arabic countries uh, to Putin. Uh, is there pragmatics or just like you say, just the uh, not very friendly attitude towards the United States and uh, they like offended, I'd say. Uh, because uh, can you explain the position of Iran? Iran has a lot of sanctions. Iran, Iran has a lot of problems inside of uh, their own politicians right now. Now. But still, they're doing what they're doing. And it's interesting for me the position of Israel. Can you understand these positions of these countries? I, I will try my best to explain. I'm, I'm, I'm more of a, of a security military studies analyst and less of a political analyst, but I, I'll, give, I'll give it my best okay. shot. Okay, from the point uh, of view of security. Okay, from the point of view yeah. of security. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, uh, okay, so on the Arabic side, I try to explain as much as I can. But the thing is, with some of, uh, I'll be very clear, some of the Russian propaganda uh, has worked here. Has worked here because uh, it touched some nerves, you know, the anti Western, yeah. the idea that, uh, oh, it's, it, oh, it's all a Western conspiracy, it's, oh, it's all a CIA, uh, you know, conspiracy of some sort, you know. Uh, all of that worked here. And also you have regimes who are very close to, who are less and less close to democracy and freedoms and, and uh, the rule of law, and more and more close to what Mr. Putin wants, you know, like more, more of an authoritarian repressive system. And, and some of the regimes in the region here, see, this is the, this is the model, not, not, not the, uh, you know, not, not democratization and alternation of power. So in that sense, yeah, there, there's some, uh, you can play when you have some inclination towards a regime type, the propaganda sometimes can work. In uh, the uh, Iran is not an Arab country, but Iran has been. This is still a debate: is it a tactical uh, or an operational level or a strategic alliance with Russia? You know, they they have been uh, almost on this in the same front, despite some differences in the same front in Syria. Um, so I think it's it's uh, it looks like Iran is getting more and more into bringing the Middle East uh, or part of the Middle East into the. Uh, 
uh, into the uh, Russian side and into Ukraine, unfortunately. With the with Israel, it's a it's an it, interesting story. I guess this is not this is not this is less Russian propaganda and more Russian power. You know, uh, military power. They're close. They're in Syria, and uh, Israel has too uh, many enemies in Syria, including uh, all of uh, Iran's uh, uh, let's say allied militias. You know, like Hezbollah and, and uh, others, and uh, and they. Uh, Let's put it very clearly. Israel has some uh, significant weapons that can help yep. uh, Ukraine. There are things that actually uh, Israel can do. Uh, it doesn't want to do mainly because of the hard power of Russia and, and, and there's a strategic, let's say, calculus in the region here uh, in terms of escalation and de-escalation. I think Israel is trying to maintain that one. I see. Okay, and uh, going back to the dragons and snakes, I still have two, two main questions to you. One more quote I will use right now. In February 1993, former CIA director James Woolsey famously described the post-Cold War environment by stating that the United States and its allies slayed a large dragon, the Soviet Union, but ended up in a jungle full of snakes warlords in failed states, terrorism, and various sub-state threats. So my question is, why such smart and trained intelligence services all around the world allowed these snakes and dragons to grow up? And do they try to change the situation right now? The thing is, it's uh, uh, the idea that uh, intelligence agencies in, in the U.S. controls everything it's a very wrong idea. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's not true. It's it, okay. the idea that they are everywhere and they have control over it. The, the U.S. decided in the end, after 20 years of an attempt to build a democracy in Afghanistan, had to withdraw its forces there yeah. in, after, after 20 years war. And the same thing in Iraq, you know, it ended up... So the U.S. has many successes, right? It has many, many, many successes, but it's it's not always that successful. And uh, the, you know, it, it did build the democracies. It did succeed in in, in you know, Germany, Japan, South Korea, mm -hmm. Kosovo, Bosnia, maybe. Um, but it, it it failed in in multiple other attempts, including the the ones I mentioned: Afghanistan, Iraq, South Vietnam. It was it was supposed to be a model on you know based on South Korea. It did not did not really go well and. Uh, they end up uh, uh, leaving. So what they offer and what Europe offers is much, much better than any system we knew, politically and militarily. You know, um, I, I think uh, Russia's uh, reforms that was attempted after the Georgia war in 2008 was in a way to create an all-volunteer army, fat-free, focused and professional, to be able to fight uh, that, and and, uh, and and I think it failed. You know, the Ukraine showed that this has failed. Uh, so it was an attempt always to mimic uh, the U.S. in the in in not in its political system, but but always in the way of fighting. The the interesting part, you know, what we called wrongly Grasimov doctrine. It's not Grasimov, and it's not a doctrine, you know, but, but it, it went like that in the media. That was based on a misunderstanding, like, like you know, the, 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 that idea that U.S. controlled everything. So the revolution in Serbia to Southern, that was a U.S. plot. Uh, the revolution in Georgia to Southern three, that was a U.S. plot. The uh, Orange Revolution to Southern and four in Ukraine, that was another CIA plot. Uh, the revolution to Southern and five in Kyrgyzstan, that's another uh, U.S. plot. The Arab Spring, all you know, from Tunisia 2010 to Egypt and Libya 2011 to Syria 2011 to Yemen, to Southern, all this was a U.S. plot, and now and then again now uh, Maidan was a, a U.S. plot. Mm -hmm. So that, so this is this is actually I'm I'm not saying this is actually what they believe. I think you know this, this is what the, the Russian leadership believe, Obviously. and I think that that doctrine, that Grasimov doctrine, was based on this idea: if they are that good in changing regimes that they that that were authoritarian and corrupt and close to us, then we better do this the same. So we better you know start planning to invade countries um, and changing regimes. Uh, so that we're, uh, we're, we're we do like them, you know. So it's an attempt to imitate the U.S. Imitate between quotations because the U.S. did not really do that. But I see. It's an attempt to imitate the U.S. in that way, 
and, and it's based on a false premise. At the end of our conversation, I would like to uh, hear your prognosis because uh, uh, what once started uh, with the idea to take over Ukraine by Putin now comes to not losing Donetsk and Crimea or not losing the power in his own country. So what's the use in throwing away billions, billions of dollars a day with no result, not on the battlefields, not in political fields, uh, more and more boycott countries uh, for Putin around uh, uh, a lot of uh, civilized states and countries. How can you see what will change the, the way of, uh, of this history of war? I think it was all, uh, you put it very eloquently, so uh, I think it was all based on a big miscalculation. Like the misperception of uh, the so-called uh, Grasimov doctrine, that was also a major miscalculation. The idea there was, oh, oh, I'm not going to spend that much uh, money or or, uh, or, or blood uh, in, in attacking uh, or in invading Ukraine and changing the regime. So uh, like Yanukovych, you know, he, he fled to Moscow. You know, Zelensky and, uh, you know, Poroshenko and all the, the that elite that came after my dad will flee to London and Washington. and. And that's it. I'll take even it. Was, this, I think this this was the thinking, you know. It was an mm -hmm. I, I, irregular operation that went wrong. They didn't flee. They all stayed. And I don't know how did they miss that. How did they miss? Because they saw how, when Ukraine wanted to fight. Okay, Crimea was okay. It was one off. I, I spoke to many of the soldiers that left Crimea, and they were all. They reminded me of you know some of the other armies that lost uh, wars here in the region. And they are very, very angry to at that loss and wanted to, you know, fight back. So Crimea, every everybody I met was like Crimea. It, it happened once; it will never happen again, and we'll get it back. The the idea that you know whatever happens in Crimea will be repeated in Kiev proved to be wrong. So now what's next? Uh, so his his next approach was retrenchment. So I'm going to withdraw from the, uh, or, or actually I was beaten in Kiev. I was beaten in Jutomer. I was beaten in uh, Cherniv. First, uh, first uh, tank battalion, and what they did there was was like brilliant by all uh, first tank brigade. Sorry, uh, he was beaten in Izum. He was beaten in Liman. He was beaten everywhere, and now is here so yeah. uh, yeah. closer and closer. So, the, uh, but, but this is in phase two. Well, phase two was okay. I was beaten in all these uh, mm. us, so I'm going to retrench back. Retrench back where? In Donetsk and Luhansk. And try and try to to get them, and in Kherson as well. In phase two, he had one success in Luhansk when he when he co controlled the oblast. The only oblast that that was that fell to Russian to Russian invasion since Crimea. But now the uh, the, the we're back. Now the uh, ZSU is back in Luhansk, and mm -hmm. so so now the the he went from retrenchment to okay mobilization and escalation and annexation. So, okay, so now I, I lost all these troops, I lost all these blood, so I need, I need to mobilize to sustain them. But mobilize with what? You know, if he did the mobilization earlier, maybe in April, then he would have had a bit more uh, equipment and a bit more uh, figures now, uh, a bit more n numbers in terms mm -hmm. of the manpower. Um, and then he went with the escalation, which would be a, a escalation in terms of annexation, annex annexing territory. It would be a black comedy show if it wasn't a human tragedy. If it wasn't an invasion, it would be a black show. So I'm annexing territories that I don't even militarily control them. Yep. And I've been trying to control them for six months and I've been failing for, to do so. Uh, so my response is annex them. And then after I annex them, I claim them Russian territory and therefore I can use nuclear, uh, you know, I threaten with a nuclear attack mm -hmm. if territories were taken from me. It's, you know, you can't make, it would be a black comedy show Absolutely. in Hollywood if it wasn't real, you know? Absolutely. Um, the, I think the idea was based on, okay, President Zelensky's um, uh, ratings were low before the invasion. But any political science undergraduate student would tell you that if a country gets invaded yeah. by a foreign uh, aggressor who already invaded it before six years ago, or eight years ago in 2014, probably the population will rally around the president. You know, we call it rally around the flag theory in political science. Now, now it's at a, at a strategic failure level, but I think it will lead in the end to also an operation, a complete operational failure, uh, followed by uh, probably the liberation of 
the lands that were annexed by, by Russia. This is my last short question, and I hope for your short answer. What will I'm sorry. <laughs> what will stop? What will stop the war? Who will stop the war? Ukrainian forces, uh, the forces of NATO and uh, alliance, or the uh, collapse of Russian Federation that's already starting from ethnic groups from far away out of Moscow. No, the decision to stop that war, to be very clear, is in Moscow. You know, this war could stop uh, now mm -hmm. <laughs> if there was a time for. Uh, uh, of Mr. Putin to, to, to stop it. But apparently he he's still in the mood of he may win something out of this. Uh, I think it's the, the current leadership in, in NATO countries, or let's say most NATO countries, uh, and in Ukraine, are, are very, very clear about the modus operandi of Moscow right now. It's, uh, it's not a matter of negotiations. Uh, you need to show strength, you need to show resistance, and you actually need to uh, beat them in the battlefield. So I think the main decision now is the battlefield. I predicted the idea that, like the, like ISIS, ISIS pulled like almost miraculous operational victories between 2013 and 2015. And Russia did as well some operational victories in 2014. Crimea, that was a, quite a spectacular one, but also pulled some operational victories in 2014, 2022. But both of them um, was, uh, will end up in a strategic failure. He wanted to get to the history uh, textbooks, so he's already in them. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your explanation and your uh, view of the situation. Um, I will remind that we were talking with Professor Omar Ashur, is Professor of Security and Military Studies. Thank you, and hopefully see you again. Thanks.